David, how are you, sir? I'm well. I'm well. Hey, Michael, how are you, sir? I'm well. It's good to see you. That's a familiar. That's a familiar image <laughs> in your in your work den there. <laughs> and have you and have you been? I've been well. Cool. You know, okay. life is uh, moving. You know, hopefully getting all back to normal. You know, going in the office still a couple of days a week now. So, sure, it's getting sure, better. Sure. And the family? Everyone's doing good. My daughter's uh, doing her thing and. A grad school program and my son is uh should be graduating college this uh may proud daddy for mm -hmm. sure proud daddy i'm glad to see that well i know people i know we're one, one minute we're one minute after and people typically just roll in when they get ready to but um i'm not going to hold us up i'm going to get this interview going and they'll come in as they want we got 50 people that registered uh to attend so we'll see if they all show up but in the meantime we're gonna record this for posterity, but I've got to go through a couple of things before we get there. So bear with me for a minute while I just go through uh, sort of the highlights of what we're gonna be doing today. Is that okay? Sounds good. Thanks, man. Thanks again, Michael. I appreciate your commitment. So Randy and Oma, I oh, uh, hope I don't tear up that name, but I'm not going to try. And John McLaughlin, there's a couple more people that'll be flooding in here hopefully soon. And uh, in the meantime, what I wanna do is just go through our normal process of you know, speaking about the fact that this is I see this is Cyversity, new organization Cyversity, and this is our mission statement. We're always focused on a consistent representation of women and minorities in the cybersecurity industry, and we do that through a whole myriad of, of, of programs that are designed to foster attraction, training, recruitment, inclusion, equity, and of course retention over the over the term. We are a membership organization. And just this January, we started our paid membership program where students invest $20 in themselves for a term and professionals invest $100 uh, to be a member of Cyversity to get access to a lot of our programs. And those programs, of course, are the benefits of Cyversity's, uh, Cyversity organization, where you go through career exploration, cybersecurity skills assessment, which of course is like an assessment of your current skills and where you're going and where you'd like to go, where we help you develop through uh, Cyversity events, scholarships, training, mentorship programs, and of course, through networking and our chapters, which there are five of them now. And you probably will be looking to see, I'll, I'll host all five chapters in a near upcoming program, upcoming interview. Our topic areas are typically career development, career spotlighting, uh, transitioning uh, from where you are to where you'd like to be, leadership and tech talks. And typically throughout the year, we highlight um, several events and or uh, periods of time that we're focused on. Of course, this month is Black History Month. In May, we have Asian American, Asian American and Pacific Islanders and Senior Citizens Month. In June, it's LGBTQ Pride Month. In September, Latin Hispanic, uh, Latin Heritage Month, and so forth and so on for October, November, and December. Just a few ground rules. Please mute your microphones. Uh, please mute yourself so that there's no background noise. And this conversation usually takes about 60 minutes uh, where we're focusing on leadership, diversity, equity, um, mentee inclusion, mentee training, mentee development. And there's gonna be a question and answer period at the end, at the close of the conversation. So if you wanna come off uh, mute and ask your question to Michael, who's our guest today. Do that or put your question in the chat. And again, this session is being recorded so that it uh, can be distributed. Now, to our interviewee today. The image there is of Michael Palmer. He is the Chief Information Security Officer at Hearst mm -hmm. Communications. Uh, Michael is the is responsible and he leads the enterprise-wide vision, strategy, and architecture for information security and technology risk management at Hearst Communication, which is a huge undertaking. You can see from um, this highlight uh, scenario or this highlight image here on screen, he's got quite a few highlights and he's got quite a few strengths. We haven't seen any weaknesses there, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get to any of those if they happen to come up in the conversation. 
Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to back out of that and I'm going to get over here to uh, bring up my image so that we can see each other again. Am I doing this right? There you go. Uh, there. there, 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 there. I think stop sharing. And there I am. And there they are. Not more people there. Um, so I just went, went through an introduction of Michael Palmer. I have a, a litany of questions and I typically start these questions by asking, uh, and I'm looking to, the, to my right here because all of my questions are over here. I typically ask these questions of uh, our interviews of their life's journey. I know that Michael, in our conversation, you had a, a slide deck that you'd like to propose uh, to, to show. If it's able to come up when you um, go to share, uh, fine. If not, I can put it up and you can walk through it. So you try, Michael, to go ahead and present and it's working and you can go through that slide deck. And you're on mute, Michael, so remember here. Okay, so do you hear me now? I can hear you now, Michael. Okay, do you see my slide? I see your slides. Okay, I'm all set. Now you're muted. Yeah, good. Did you want to go through the deck or did you want me to ask you, continue asking questions? Oh, well, like why don't you start off on the first question and I think that'll naturally go into the deck. Good, good. So I'm always interested in how um, security practitioners like yourself start your, your career, launch your career, go through your career, end up where you are, what it took to get there, uh, not not everybody on here knows who you are. Some do, some don't. But if you would just give us a just give us the litany of Mike, Michael's journey to where he is today, if you don't mind. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, David, and thanks for inviting me. And I really appreciate everyone coming in, hear me uh, talk about you know my journey. Um, so you'll see my slide. Hopefully, you see that up on the screen and. Um, you'll see the bottom is actually my career path, um, and then you have the highlights, but then the strengths. Uh, the thing that I kind of like to overall say is that, you know, I think that I've been incredibly blessed in my journey. Um, I basically come from a low income, single parent uh, household uh, in an underserved community, right? So another way of saying that I kind of grew up poor, right? Um, and I've had the fortune of having you know, a very strong mother uh, who helped me with uh, developing most of the strengths that you see on this uh, uh, deck. Uh, I hear a lot of noise. I don't know if you can mute uh, or William, if you can mute your, uh... okay, great. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, I think my mother's helped me with uh, uh, forming a lot of my strengths. And, you know, through these strengths, I've been able to attract mentors and sponsors. And I know that's a big portion of, you know, what Cyversity, you know, tries to do with, you know, attracting and growing talent into cybersecurity, especially into, you know, an, uh, you know the overall underserved communities. But, you know, that's had a very strong, you know, beginning for me with, you know, the strengths helping me with attracting those mentors and sponsors. Uh, so I'll go back to the beginning. Um, you know, I, I guess I'll go back to kind of like uh, uh, my first college experience, right? So I actually applied to several colleges, Lincoln, which was a HBCU, um, NYU, um, I got accepted into that as well as into Baruch College. But, you know, I also applied for several scholarships to help pay for those schools. And unfortunately, I didn't get any. So the only thing that I had to do was basically self-fund my education, right? So um, Baruch being part of the City University of New York, it was a very economical decision for me. And also Baruch was also one of the top rated business schools within the country. So it was a very easy choice for me to make and go with Baruch. Uh, one of the things that I, I did as a goal is, um, you know, that, you know, I was very focused on is again, I didn't really want to, uh, be in a position where in my adult life or, or even having my family uh, with my children experiencing poverty. So, you know, my mother told me in order to kind of escape that, you know, dilemma, you have to have a great education, right? That'll help you with getting a great job. You know, she did multiple jobs. I mean, she actually had like three or four jobs 
you know, she even like cleaned houses in Long Island, New York, uh, for like twenty dollars a day back in the eighties. Um, so definitely, she was a, an encouragement and inspiration to me. Um, so one of the things that you know I wanted to do was have that good career path, you know. And I thought, you know, finance. You know, I did some uh, uh, courses in high school around accounting. Um, I thought that that would be a great direction for me. So in Baruch. Uh, one of the interesting things is that when you go to register for classes as a freshman, you're low man on the totem pole. So, you know, you're competing with everyone else to try to get all these finance courses. So hardly got any finance courses. So I started taking my liberal arts courses, started taking computer science courses. Um, by the time I was able to get some finance courses, uh, I realized I didn't like finance and uh, computers I really did like. So I actually ended up switching my major. Um, at the time too, one of the things that I was also, again, was about self-funding my education. So I actually ended up working full-time um, at a company called Alexander's, which was a department store in New York City. And I worked there as a cashier, making minimum wage. So I worked full-time, five days a week. Um, I went to school full-time, two days a week. Um, my school courses started at 8 a.m., finished at 8 p.m. Um, I lived in a section of New York where I had to take uh, two, you know, bus and a train, if you're familiar with New York. So it took me two hours to get to school. So during my lunchtime at work, during my, my commuting time going into and from school um, is when I did all my studying, you know, and I did that for about four to five years before I got my degree uh, while working at Alexander's. Towards my senior year in Alexander's, they went bankrupt. Um, and through a friend of mine, I actually ended up getting a job at Madison Square Garden as a computer operator. Uh, so it was a great job. Um, and the best thing about that job was is that the person who hired me is my now current wife. So, you know, we've been married for 26 years. So I think it kind of worked out. You know, I know that's not a politically correct thing to do in this, these, these, these times, but hey, it worked for me, right? So, uh, you know, we have two beautiful children uh, who are both college age at this particular point in time. Um, so that's kind of my, my journey there at Madison Square Garden. She actually went to Emblem Health, which is a company called GHI, was the name of it before, which is a healthcare company. Um, I moved over to there. I started doing networking. So it was back then it was Nobel Networks. Um, and I supported that for the HR department. As my wife and I started dating, decided I needed to get out of uh, HR and we moved. I moved and she stayed in HR. I moved to um, MIS, which was technology, management information systems at the time. Um, stayed there for about a year, you know, and actually moved to a company called Ascom Timeflex. Uh, and my last day at GHI was the day before we got married. So that was an interesting aspect. Worked at Ascom Timeflex, uh, which was a great organization. Um, they really wanted me to focus in on networking and troubleshooting and working with uh, customers uh, on networking issues. Um, they taught me a lot about wide area networking um, uh, and protocols, and I learned a lot about computers and how to connect them together. And then about a year into me working there, they decided that they were going to get out of the networking business and go back to multiplexers, which I thought was a very bad decision. And it was because they went bankrupt in about two years. Uh, but I then left there, went to Dreyfus, uh, which is a mutual fund company, which is now owned by BNY Mellon Bank. I really focused there on networking again, on local and wide area networking. Worked there for about a year um, and um, decided after that, it really wasn't a company that was a great fit for me um, and where I wanted to go in my career. So uh, I was able to now transition to the NFL where I ultimately worked there for 22 years. Um, started off as, again, as a network manager and about maybe about 12 years into that role, made a proposition to management about starting up a security area. They liked the idea and I became the NFL's first CISO. Um, and I was a CISO there for about eight years. Um, after that, went to um, a company called Hearst. Um, actually, let me uh, move here. Hearst is a great company, $11 billion company, 135 years old at this point. Started off in newspapers and communications and now is a major holding conglomerate, have about 23,000 employees, about 360 companies in our portfolio, divided up into a variety of different areas. And you can see on this chart, everything from um, traditional broadcast media, which would be television, magazines, newspapers, um, which is what we call our 
um, um, broadcasting uh, or media businesses. And now we're into diversified information and services uh, businesses, which include healthcare, transportation service organizations, um, as well as uh, others. A lot of people aren't really familiar with some of our companies, but you use them in your day-to-day -day interaction. A uh, good example is with um, uh, Hearst Health, uh, one of our companies, uh, FDB. Um, if you go into a drugstore, let's say CVS, and you're getting a prescription filled, and the pharmacist is looking for any interaction between the current drugs you're taking versus the new prescription you're going to get, you know, they're utilizing our database to do that. So we service like 90% of the world's pharmacies and hospitals. So, you know, we have a lot of different data that we're protecting, everything from healthcare, PHI to uh, PII around subscriptions, especially with magazines. Um, we have about 250 magazines in our portfolio, everything from car and driver to Oprah. Uh, newspapers, a lot of magazine subscriptions, journalist information that we're protecting. So a very wide amount of data and information that we're protecting across the organization. So that's kind of Hearst in a nutshell. Ooh, and my Michael. career journey. <laughs> Michael, that is, that's uh... That's huge. I mean, I knew some of your background, but I didn't know all of it. And that is incredible. I mean, that's, you know, the whole traverse from where you started uh, at Beirut and end up here at Hearst is a, is a heck of a journey. And now you're at a company that's a holding firm for 23,000 folks, multiple companies that you're providing the security for. I mean, that's huge. How do, how, this is, Pardon me, Michael. How the hell do you do that? How do you protect these organizations? And as a CISO, where do you sit? So this is sort of a two-prong question. As a CISO, how do you do it? And where do you sit in the organization? And who do you report to? Who reports to you? Just give us that, because it's really, it's really engaging what you just said, Michael. Really. I'm not being, I'm not blowing smoke. Honestly, I'm not. That's just crazy. I just didn't know that you were doing all that. But mm -hmm. please give us give us the background there, please. Well, so just in regards to reporting structure, right? So I am a senior executive within the organization, right? And I sit, um, I report to the CIO of the organization, Chief Information Officer, you know, and there's been a lot of talk and discussion in regards to where the CS, CISO should report, should report to the CIO, the CEO, the COO, the general counsel, you know, to me, it doesn't really make a difference, right? The question is, is at my level, do I have the ability of collaborating, networking, and discussing with all of the various senior leaders from the organization, right? So I'm meeting with the CEO, I'm meeting with the CFO, I'm meeting with the general counsel, with the you know, head of marketing, the head of finance, the head of uh, this. And I'm also meeting with all the various different businesses as well. So, you know, part of what, uh, you know, if you go back to uh, one of my strengths, uh, actually, it's not slide before, you know, it's about, you know, collaboration and relationship management. That's a, a huge portion of, of this. Um, sorry, I'm uh, messing around with these slides. Take your time, no worries. We're, uh, we're here, we're here. Yep, yep. So um, the, 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 the key part of this is, right, is around collaboration and influence, right? So um, basically being able to have those conversations with, all the various different levels of management throughout the organization is, is really key, right? So um, I do it a lot through collaboration and committees, right? So, you know, I have a committee for payment card industry. I have a committee for risk management. I have a committee for, um, for um, uh, security awareness training throughout the organization. You know, and I'm meeting with a variety of the different senior leaders. So we're having constant communications and discussions. I'm able to understand the, the, the strategy as far as what they're looking at doing from a business perspective. You know, I also sit on the senior leadership team of the technology department. Um, so I understand what technologies that we're putting forward together. You know, and the ultimate role for a CISO, right, is, is to drive that enterprise vision and mission, right? Because when you think about a company, and you probably have heard this saying before, every company is a technology company nowadays, right? Technology is at the core of every single company, you know? So part of what the CISO's job is to do is to help the company with 
you know, managing that business risk as it opposed as to when technology integrates into it. So having that seat at that top level and understanding the strategy of where the company is going uh, monumentally helps with that. And of course, I have a great team, you know, and that's part of what a CISO does is puts together a great team of folks that can execute onto the strategy and execute on the tactics. Incredible. You know, of course, Michael, we shared a whole bunch of questions earlier, but as you were talking, it just brought up more questions, right? It just elicited more questions. And one of the things that I've seen with CISOs of today is that they have to, and you tell me if I'm correct, they have to be a good interpreter or a good translator of technical requirements to executives so that they can tell me how you're how you're handling and doing that because it seems like if you're a good translator or a good interpreter, the C, the C level folks that you engage with understand the problem and help you by funding that through your 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 engagements. But give us a little bit more because you're in the you're there in the weeds there. Yeah, so you know I'm fortunate because of my background and my experience, right? So as I mentioned earlier, you know I have that technical background. I work with networks. I work with routers and switches and databases and applications and wireless and, you know, um, processing systems. Um, I've worked across, you know, different departments and know how uh, they function from an HR perspective uh, uh, or from a finance perspective, you know, having that kind of, you know, taking those finance classes in college, as I mentioned, at least something rubbed off on me, right? So I, I, I have that business acumen as well as that technology savviness, right? So those are two portions that is a, a, a key. And I think one of the things that I also show on my strengths is about solving problems, right? So what I try to do in my general course of action is, you know, through relationship management, is understand what the business leaders are trying to achieve, right? So when we're talking about funding a particular technology initiative, I'm not going to them and saying that we need to upgrade, you know, these routers because of, uh, you know, a vulnerability. You know, I'm talking to them about their key initiatives, right? So if they're trying to grow revenue by 5%, you know, over, you know, five years or, you know, uh, something of that nature, I'm talking to them in that language and telling them how, uh, why investing into this technology is going to basically be able to help them with doing that, you know, that they would avoid pitfalls that, you know, this will allow those systems to stay up and operational, the process, you know, the data that's going to allow them to generate those revenues, that if the systems go down, it's gonna cause uh, mass disruption, and it's probably gonna cause our uh, clients to go to another customer. So I'm doing that translation and interpreting um, and putting it in the context of business talk, right? Mm -hmm. And then when I'm talking to technology folks, you know, I'm talking to them at, you know, what, what they're interested in, in, in growing. So, you know, I'm trying to build relationships and enable, right? And the key thing there is you have to find out what's in it for them, right? Mm. You want to know what's in it for the business folks. You want to know what's in it for the technology folks and figure out how to give them both what they are looking for. And that helps with bridging the gap and um, pushing things forward and getting buy-in on both sides. Mm. If you mentees, uh, some of you that are, have been my mentees or I've worked with, if you're hearing this, these, the critical thing that you heard Michael say that I think I may have repeated over and over again, it's about the business. Without the business, the technology may not even be necessary. It may not even be relevant. So it's about the business. Michael, the, it sounds like from your perspective, you've had a technical background. Um, and you spent some time developing a technical acumen. Is this required? Is this necessary to be a CISO? Is this, is this, you know, is it a good, is it a nice to have or is it a must have? I would say it's a nice to have, right? I think one of the key things about being a CISO is also being a good manager, right? So having, as I mentioned, having a great team and, you know, part of having a great team is building a team that's going to help make you stronger you know, as a leader, as a person who is creating a function in your department. And if you have a gap in technical skills, then you're going to have a strong, let's say, security architect or 
a network engineer, you know, that can help with supplementing those, uh, you know, needs, right? So I think that I've seen a lot of great CISOs who may not be technical, but the thing is, is that they're great managers, right? Mm. And they know how to empower their people. They know how to empower their program. They know how to, um, you know, supplement, you know, their weak. You, you mentioned earlier about weaknesses, right? The whole key thing about weaknesses is, right, is that how do you make a weakness into a strength? So if you can build a great team that supplements some of your weaknesses, um, you know, you're going to strengthen your capabilities. So right. that's my answer to your question is that you don't have to have that technical acumen, but you have to have a way of getting that technology and basically being able to interpret it in some way, shape or form. Glad to hear that, you know, at least I'll paraphrase it. I don't have to be the smartest person in the room. I can always surround myself with people that are smarter than me in their specifics or in their generality and help an organization. The a question I wanted to ask you is this whole concept, and I'm sort of digressing a little bit in our, in our conversation, this whole concept of people, process, and technology. Is that the right first step, second step, third step? Is that out of, you know, you hear it all the time, people, process, technology. This is what it's all about when it comes to security. This is what it's all about, you know, when it comes to technology. Is this the right step? Are people critically important, process secondly important, technology thirdly important, or are they all balanced out equal? Give us your perspective. I think it's all balanced out equal, right? And I think a great way of representing that is by having a stool that has three legs. Right, um, and this is the way how I've always showed it in kind of diagrams. <clears throat> and if you think about each leg, one leg being uh, people, one leg being technology, and one leg being process, right? What happens if you grow one of those legs around, let's say for example, technology, you're buying all these great cybersecurity tools, right? But your people don't know how to utilize them. What's gonna end up happening when you try to put something on that stool, which is probably the top sitting on the stool is the business, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The stool's gonna fall over right? Because it's going to be unequally balanced because one leg is going to be stronger than the other. Um, so when you're looking at, you know, coming up with a solution, you need to make sure that all sides are balanced out, right? Your people have to understand how to utilize the technology, which means that they probably have to have the process uh, in place, right? And uh, know how to integrate between that technology and the process. So I think it has to be balanced out. Otherwise, you're going to run into problems because something's going to fall off of the stool. Sure, sure. Um, I often wanted to ask folks like you, I mean, you've got to have this core sense of why. Why do I do this? Why am I in cybersecurity? Why am I, why am I, why am I, who, wh wh what is my, who, what is my personal why that I'm in cybersecurity, that I'm, you know, on boards of directors that I'm doing what the things that you do, Mike, what is your, what is your core why? And I'm sure there's some passion in there, but just give us your core why, if you don't mind. So my, my core why, right, and why I do all the things that I do is for my family, right? Or it's wow. for my, 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 my wife and my kids, uh, my mother. Um, as I mentioned with my mother, you know, one of the things that I'm very proud of is, is that you know, she worked very hard in, you know, my youth to make, you know, put a roof over our heads and feed us, you know, and now she's living with us, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, she has basically her own area and she doesn't have to worry about anything, you know, right. uh, for the rest of her life, right? And, you know, that was something that, you know, I was driven to kind of really do. You know, my kids, um, as I think I mentioned when I came on, on, the, on the call, you know, I work, we work very hard to make sure that they would be successful in life. You know, and both kids did have special disabilities and we had to put a lot of focus on mm. those things to make sure, you know, and my daughter, you know, she's, uh, uh, she has an undergrad from MIT in mechanical engineering. She has a master's from Stanford and she's working in a lab today to do her, get her doctorate in uh, robotics and, and mechanical engineering. You know, my son is, you know, had a disability as well, and he's graduating from RIT, you know, in May, you know, and it looks like he has some really great job prospects and he's going to be doing well. 
right? So that was my why in making sure that, you know, my kids, my family, you know, they're, you know, have a great path moving forward, you know, and now I kind of look at it, okay, what's, you know, my next why, right? And I think that as again, as I mentioned, when I first opened up, you know, I've been blessed, right? And, you know, I came from a, a very tough neighborhood, very tough situation and circumstances, you know, how can I give back, right? And how can I help? So it's really about trying now to figure out how can I scale to help solve some of those problems. Can't solve them on my own, sure. but I can be impactful in utilizing the platform that I have to aid in those, those matters. Yeah, and you are doing that, Mike. You are doing that with a couple of other organizations, not only ICMC, not, not only Cybersity, but also on the board of our advisory board for RIT, but also... ITSM, ITSMF. And so those organizations that you're contributing your time to, what's the, what's the point of giving of your time to those organizations? What do you give? What do you get from giving to those organizations? Well, let's take, for example, ITSMF, right? And I think that I got a huge amount out of that organization, right? Because when you look at life, right, you always want to see those role models. You always want to see those folks that can operate at that level. And I remember, you know, when I was at the NFL was when I met, you know, the ITSMF organization, you know, I was a director and I was a director for about 12 years at that point. You know, my, 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 my career was a little stagnant, but I was okay with that. Again, I, we were concentrating on the kids, you know, I was putting a lot of effort there, you know, so um, I got introduced into the ITSMF, and when I heard about it, I heard about there's an organization that has, you know, uh, you know, about 100, 120 or so different senior leaders who are African Americans who are CIOs um, at, you know, Fortune 500 companies. And I'm like, I didn't believe that, right? Because you know, I would go to all these conference conferences and, you know, networking events, and I didn't see anyone like me. You know, so when I went to ITSMF, I remember it was a meeting, the first one in Atlanta, and they were having the technology awards. And, you know, you had all these African-Americans wearing tuxes, right? Mm -hmm. And evening gowns. Um, it was like an incredible sight to see. And to see that, you know, the CIO for Procter & Gamble was an African-American woman. To see that the global CIO of Lloyd was an African-American man you know, and, you know, the, the, the number of people in senior level positions, it was just astonishing. So right. when I saw that, I was like, okay, now I'm inspired. And, you know, I have to now kind of push that envelope. And, um, you know, I got a lot of mentorship out of that organization, you know, from people giving me advice, you know, and some of it wasn't really formal. Some of it was, you know, we would come down for breakfast that morning and I'm sitting at this with the CIO from Cummings or I'm sitting mm. with, you know, the CIO from Estee Lauder. Um, and, you know, they're just telling us about some of the things that they've kind of walked through, you know, and now I kind of at that point where I'm now that other person on the table side, right? And people are looking, as you kind of said, at me. And, you know, it's great being that person that can help inspire others. So, you know, that's what I kind of get out of it. And, you know, I'm happy to kind of keep pushing that model and, trying to get as many folks into senior level positions as possible. Great. Um, I wanted to delve back into some industry questions, if you don't mind. I know that there's a huge, uh, there's a, a good amount of folks that are aspiring to be in your position when they on the call and I'll get to them shortly so that they can ask questions. But I wanted to get this, this whole concept of security parity meaning security across the enterprise from one of the end of the enterprise to another to the other. And your, your organization, I'm assuming, has several vendors that provide services for you that support your security approach or plan or security, your security plan. Are they required to be at the same level of security? I mean, you've got the money to do it. They may not have the money to do it. How do you, are we there yet with security parity? And if we're not, how do we get there? And how do you help your vendors get there? Sort of a three-pronged question. If you so know. one of the things that we published is security guidelines or security requirements. 
So these are the minimum levels, or this is the bar that we're looking for in regards to how systems, devices, applications, you know, operate. And that's where I think we are in trying to make sure that we get parity across the board, right? And this is a big debate going on right now in industry. And, you know, I'm, I, I also sit with um, some of the other CISOs that we talk about this. And we've had this conversation a lot in regards to vendor requirements, right? Mm -hmm. And as you mentioned, there are vendors that are, you know, part of, let's say, a multi-billion dollar organization who don't have that, right? But then you also have some vendors that are startups, you know, and that are, you know, either mom and pop shops or they're just trying to struggle and get off the ground. So we try to help them in different ways, right? So one of the things that I'm actually very proud of is that I'm actually the executive sponsor at Hearst or one of the executive sponsors at Hearst for our supply diversity program. You know, so what we're trying to do there is we're trying to make sure that, you know, we look at it from the standpoint, our consumers of our products are from a diverse background. You know, we think that the money that we spend with our vendors should also be of a similar diverse background. Mm, so, interesting. you know, we've been working on trying to, um, you know, level the playing field in regards to, uh, having more vendors that are women-owned, uh, minority-owned, LGBTQ, uh, veterans, uh, that have an opportunity to uh, solicit for business with Hearst. You know, and we've been doing some programs of trying to educate them and work with them on identifying what the opportunities are and how they may be able to provide some of their services there. You know, so there's a couple of things I think there that we're, we're, we're trying to uh, help some of those smaller businesses with. Sure, sure. Um, I'm going to read this question if you don't mind. CISOs face multiple challenges such as true telemetry from stem to stern. Uh, I'm using the boating te te terminology there. Um, with tech and, and having not only this need to have full view to the end user, now you also have a proliferation of technology that either you purchased because you've acquired another company or you purchased because you they somehow added something to it. how do you manage this conglomeration of technologies sometimes over much and then use all that stuff to get true vision to the baseline to the to that last <laughs> desktop in the basement if you will how do you how do you how do you work that process so I, I think it ties a bit back into what I mentioned about having those requirements, right? Mm -hmm. And making sure that, you know, whatever the applications are, whether it's, let's say, for example, Cisco router or Palo Alto firewall or, you know, um, any other kind of security device, you know, there's, you know, KPIs and KRIs that we want out of those systems. And we want to make sure that we're collecting all of those and, basically ensuring that we have some sort of a strategy as far as how do we process and maintain and, and, and view all of that. Um, I also heard, you know, another part in that question in regards to, you know, solving unknown problems, right? And, you know, I'm also a big movie buff, right? And, you know, I, I watch a lot of movies. That's and true. I think That's true. one of my, one of my, if you haven't seen it, but I think one of the great movies I thought was The Martian with, with Matt Damon. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that happened to him was that he was stuck on a planet, didn't really know the planet. But one thing that he said was, is that, you know, he focused on keeping alive by solving one problem at a time right. and, you know, um, figuring out a strategy for how to, you know, solve that problem and then just keep moving on to the next one. And him, life was all about, and I, and I kind of view it the same way, Life was all about solving one problem after another, after another, after another. And what ends up happening is, is when you do that, you also start to build up this tool set of tactics to, that you use to solve those problems. And sooner or later, you start to find that the tactics that you built up could be applied to other problems that you didn't even know that you know, they can be solved for. So through uh, you know, having a strategy, solving problems, building up that tool set of capabilities, 
you can use that to apply to anything that may be unknown. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that, you know, you take it one step at a time and you just solve for what's in front of you and you just keep focusing on solving what's in front of you. Right. I was reading an article recently. I think it was a McKinsey article that was talking about how CISOs have to deal with the art of the impossibility mm -hmm. because you just don't know what you don't know. You don't know what they're going to use to attack you. And of course, when you're dealing with that, you know, there's a sense of um, panic or threat or apprehension or anxiety because you just don't know what they're going to attack you with. And, you know, rather than boil the ocean to find all these solutions, you have to have your team calm to do that. Now, you've talked about a, building a team. How do you get your team prepared for the the, in, the in, improbability of what's next that you don't know? How do you prepare them for the unknown? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I talked about movies. So here's a movie, right? The uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Horrible movie, but it was based off of a computer game that was really, really good, right? And the theme of the game was don't panic, right? So that's the first thing and foremost is don't panic, stay calm. Um, and again, work the problem one at a time. Right. And this is where, you know, one of the things that when you go into the computer security incident response game, you know, you start to build out a incident response uh, playbook or, or incident mm -hmm. response handbook. Right. So, again, you're kind of building out those tactics one at a time. But again, you're going to have the capability of, of having all of these plays that you can then utilize to handle any kind of situation. Now, you think about the game of football, right? And all of you know, I came from the NFL. You know, what does a coach do is he has these plays and he has them all in reserve. He's analyzing the field. He's looking for, you know, what he thinks is going to be the future possibilities. And then he goes to his playbook and he says, okay, I'm going to use this one. I'm going to single that to the quarterback. And that's the play that he's going to use. So think of the CISO as kind of like the, uh, the quarterback, right? But basically he has a playbook of all of these tactics that, you know, you're gonna basically be able to utilize. Mm -hmm. And part of what you're gonna do is you're going to utilize it towards whatever kind of circumstances come up sure. that you can apply that to. And again, it's about working one problem at a time. Sure, sure. And um, this, this whole concept of security uh, from, from the perspective of a CISO and folks in your, in your, in your group, I'm assuming it starts with trust. Now, you can correct me if I'm wrong there, because it starts with, I've got to trust Michael and his team to keep us safe so that we can go out and sell the widget. How do you, how do you get that level of trust continuously from the folks that you collaborate with in the C-suite above you and above you at your peer level and, be, and below you? And I don't mean that in a, in a, in a diminutive way by any means, so please. You know, I, I think the word trust in computer is becoming and in security is becoming an interesting term, right? Because we talked about trust before and then it went to trust but verify, right? <laughs> and now you're talking about zero trust, right? So, you know, I think it's a combination of those three philosophies, right? So, you know, you're going to, uh, you know, empower and trust your team right? Because you know that you provided some sort of a strategy to the team that they're going to operate off of, right? Um, and you, you, you have that faith into them. And, you know, they're going to leverage whatever the playbooks that they have to execute on. Execute. Um, and at times, they're going to come back to you and they're going to tell you what they did and how they did it. Um, and that's going to be the verify portion, right? So, you know, I think that you also have to really work on building up that relationship with and when you continuously do that over and over and over again, that's when you build the trust portion, right? Especially with your uh, business leaders, because once they have that trust and the faith in, in you, you know, they're going to trust whatever you kind of come up with. So if you tell them that, you know, the sky is blue, you know, um, over and over and over again, 50, you know, days out of the year, and they know every time they go out, the sky is blue, you know, they know that you know what you're talking about. So then sure. the day that you tell them that the sky is going to be orange, you know, they're going to have some faith in you. Sure. Right? And, sure. you know, they'll trust you because hopefully when they go out, they're going to know, wow, the sky is orange. You yeah. know, I have trust in this guy. Sure. 
Sure. I'm, you know, we're, we're at about 15 minutes too. If you, I, I don't know how much more time you have, but I haven't even hit the field yet to see what questions they have there. There's also some questions and boy, you know, Mike, I sent you a whole bunch over. I got my own questions I haven't even touched mm -hmm. yet. And so here's one question that came from the group. It was, how do you manage or coordinate with the IT department on all issues and goals? So part of what I, I do, again, I, I think a good portion of my day is around meetings, right? So I attend the senior technology leadership meetings, right? Um, and, you know, we talk about the strategy of the technology areas and the deliverables that it's going to have. But the other thing that I do is I meet with all of the key leaders. So I'm meeting with the head of the SRE team. I'm meeting with the head of the networking team, the head of the service desk teams. You know, and part of me going in there is asking them the question, you know, what can I do for you, right? Um, and then also, I'll, uh, you know, that creates that trust aspect that we talked about earlier. But, you know, they will usually let me know if there's any kind of problems. Also, understanding what their roadmaps are, you know, we kind of do that kind of an aspect. So, you know, those relationship management meetings that I have with, you know, the, the leadership team in general, and then the individual leads, because you really want to also talk to them individually, because, you know, there's a group think, and then there's also an individual think. You want to basically be able to understand both, right? So mm -hmm. relationships then matter, does matter. Great, great. Listen, I'm going to go to the, go to the group, group here. I know there's questions in the chat. Does anybody want to come off mute and ask a question? I see John McLaughlin in the audience. <laughs> we both know John. John Mack. Um, John Mack, yes, sir. I see John Mack in the audience. And then I also wanted to see if uh, anybody else had any questions that they wanted to ask. John, you want to chime in and say hi to your buddy here? And, uh, I'll, and say, I'll, say, I'll say hi to both of you guys. <laughs> so thanks for, uh, thanks for inviting me. Um, uh, yeah, so I, I know um, Michael personally. I, I know David personally. I work for Michael, I still work for Michael. And I can let the audience know that uh, he's the real deal. He is a genuine soul. Uh, he's a caring soul. He's an exceptionally good leader. Uh, he is calm under fire. And uh, I always happen to, happy to work under his command. Nice. Thank you, sir. I appreciate you. Thanks, John. I appreciate you also. Um, I don't know how to, I don't want to butcher this name. So you got your hand raised. Anwa? Please come off mute and then correct me if I if I said your name wrong, please. Yes, hi, uh, good morning or good afternoon, wherever you are. Um, yes, uh, it's Anwar, appreciate Anwar. it. Thank you. Anwar. So um, appreciate uh, to Michael for all the advice uh, that's provided and uh, related to his experience. Uh, my question as a, I just retired from the US Army, uh, significant portion of my life spent, um, in the military so I maybe you could consider me as a career changer so to speak right now moving from uh, the military to the civilian world uh, so que a question or maybe a request for advice from your perspective there for anybody not necessarily from the military but who wants to change a career or something like this uh, you know like how would you start if later in life, like you shared your experience and you just had it incrementally uh, from s different IT sections, uh, networking, wireless and all that sort of stuff. And then you built your brand incrementally, but then for people who want to change it from different fields or at a later age, how would you propose uh, marrying between the technical knowledge and the eventual management uh, perspective to gain for a second career, for example. Thank you. So first of all, Anwar, I want to thank you for your service. You know, we, we I think we, we, we really appreciate that. Um, to dive in a bit into your question, and I'm not really sure what your background is, right? But what I would try to say to do is to see if you can leverage your background into the area that you want to go into. So I'm not sure if you want to go into cyber or not, right? But there's a wide variety of different careers, uh, you know, anything from being a cyber analyst to an incident responder, to threat intelligence, to uh, security awareness, to, you know, risk manager, you know, there's a variety of different kind of careers. So 
I would try to say that you might want to try to align it to something that you've done or something that you're interested into. Hopefully what you did before you love um, as far as the specific track that you did in that particular area. So if you have an interest, I would kind of really explore, you know, that. Um, I would say that there's a variety of different materials that you can just do kind of for free, right? So uh, there's all these different websites out there that have, uh, you know, different aspects of careers. Um, um, and there's articles out there too that kind of talk about what's the availability of those. So once you kind of choose the areas that you want to go into, I would say the next thing to do is to start really networking with people that could probably give you a um, uh, an idea. And there's a variety of different ways of doing that, right? You know, you have your local uh, ISC squared and ISACA, you know, communities that are basically in every state, right? You know, there are uh, meetings that uh, vendors are holding um, all over and, you know, you can meet different people, you know, from that you know, different kind of chat rooms, you know, I, to me, I've, I've always liked the aspect of, 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 of networking, right? And then, of course, there's a variety of different kind of internships that companies are, are kind of doing, too. Uh, there are programs out there also, whether you're talking about like Empower uh, or others that do some sort of post-educational uh, uh, career training, too, that could help you with gaining some skills and then working that aspect of trying to get in uh, and recruiting. So, you know, David, I don't know if you have anything. I saw you put something in the uh, chat um, to kind of uh, dive sure. in. Those are just the top of the things off of my head. Sure, thank you. And 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 Anwar, I would suggest if you can't get an opportunity to connect with me on LinkedIn, because, you know, Michael mentioned ITS of MEF, he mentioned Empower. I always, uh, you know, defer myself to Cybersity and a couple of other groups. But if you do that, I can definitely begin to help shape, uh, you know, the resource, the resources that you'll need to begin to make decisions about which way you want to go. There's this document that I have called the cybersecurity domain. It lists all of the domains that, cyber, that, that are in cybersecurity, I believe like eight or nine of them, and then all the tentacles to each one of those domains. So there's a lot to do and a lot to find. It's just being able to center your thoughts on something that's relevant to your past experience and relevant to your future considerations that you may want to be able to look at. And, you know, I, you know, I get, I get a big boost out of helping folks do that because I, like Michael, am from a, a rough neighborhood. I grew up in Brownsville, Brooklyn. When I go back to Brownsville, it still looks like it did when I was living there in the 60s and 70s. And so I take no joy in seeing my community not developing. And I always want to try to find a way to deliver access and services to them, which I'm doing through my own company to those folks so that they get an opportunity. I suggest you, you know, ping me on my LinkedIn and maybe I can help you. I've got one or two mentees. I've got three or four mentees on the line and one mentee that just came back to me and said, I want to mentor. So that's what we're, that's what we're doing. That's what we're about here. Uh, Doc Williams, I know you've got a question. And Anwar, thank you again for asking the question. And I like to say thank you for the sacrifice that you did when you uh, went to the service. Thank you very much. Doc Williams, you have a question? Yeah. Um, hi, guys. I I want to give uh, thank you, number one, uh, Mr. Palmer, for coming on and David for putting this together. But uh, I want to go in sequence. Jason Moore had a question before me, so I want to give him the floor, please. Sure. Jason, do you want to come on real quick? He took his hand down. Yeah, I threw it in the chat, uh, so I so I wouldn't have to come on. But uh, Michael, thank you first for coming on. Um, I just wanted to understand uh, when you first took on leadership role, what was what, what one of one of your biggest first uh, lessons learned? One of your your first big lessons learned, or kind of a pivotal moment in terms of uh, an aha moment in leadership. I would say it was figuring, figuring out how to create a strategy. You know, one of, the, one of the challenges that I had to do when I first started up the security program at the NFL was there was nothing there before, right? So how do I go and kind of build that? And it was through, you know, networking, connecting with different people, understanding how other organizations did it, and then kind of putting it together. And once I was able to do that and then, 
position it in a way that was digestible to leadership, they kind of ate that up, right? So I would say that part of it too was is I wasn't really sure if people would be interested in hearing a, a, an idea from a person who didn't have the experience in the background at that particular point, but people are always interested in hearing new ideas. So I would say too, one of the things that was very pivotal in learning was is that you know there is no bad idea, but an idea that's not pitched is extremely bad. So you want to make sure that you know as a leader you're listening to all ideas, and you also want to kind of help vet them out. I'm not sure if I was very clear in that you know kind of an answer, but that that was kind of the, one of the first things that I learned. Thanks very much, Jason, for your question. Doc Williams, over to you now. Uh, yes, uh, again, thank you very much, uh, David, for putting this on with Cyversity and Mr. Palmer for coming on uh, today and sharing your journey with us and um, how you got there. It seems like it's uh, the New York triangle today between David, yourself and, and myself, uh, born in the Bronx, raised in uh, Brooklyn, Queens and law schooled in Long Island. And then I did a 38 year stint in the Air Force of which I too am retired. So um, my journey has been mostly with the government um, and some commercial in these latter seven, eight years. Uh, I've gone from, you know, being a, a, a network troop all the way up to an IDAM, Identity Access Management Operations Analyst, um, you know, IAO, uh, ISSO, CTO, and I'm in the CISO uh, ca category now. But my question is, how do you make, um, in, in my pursuit as a CISO, um, trying to perfect how do I make cyber security and, and defense of one's network digestible to leadership in a way that is beneficial to them long term? Well, I, you know, I think the, the, the challenge has gotten a lot easier over the last, let's say, three or four years than it did, let's say, 20 years ago, right? Because in a lot of cases, you were talking about hypothetical situations that may be happening. You know, today, you know, we're seeing left and right uh, major companies that are experiencing cyber challenges through ransomware. You know, they're being extorted. Their networks are going down. Their customers are now, you know, left without an ability to be serviced, which is causing them to go over to other, organ uh, other companies. You know, and bottom line, what a company is there to do is, is to make revenue. Right. So when you start to talk in terms of revenue impact and how you can help prevent them from, um, you know, being the next victim uh, with minimal amount of investment um, by implementing a certain type of a strategy, you know, they're very open to hearing those things. So it kind of goes back to the uh, standpoint of when you have an idea, you know, if you can present it in the right way you know, people are very much interested in that. You know, um, I'll tell you that, you know, part, one of my, you know, first pitches, you know, at the NFL was, was about protecting revenue around sponsorships. Mm -hmm. You know, um, Visa was one of the NFL's uh, uh, premier sponsors, you know, but Visa was also a credit card brand and they were also the creators of the PCI you know, program along with MasterCard, Discover, and, Visa, and um, American Express. So I kind of put it in terms of, you know, if we don't abide by these programs and we have a credit card breach, you know, um, you know, a quarter of our revenue comes in via sponsorships. You know, um, our sponsor is going to be really pissed off at us. I didn't say it in that way. Uh, is going to be really pissed off at us if we didn't abide by their rules. And it would behoove us to make sure that we're implementing that. And they said, we have a gap. You know, let's get that fixed, you know. So again, finding a way of, you know, again, what's in it for me, right? What's in it for the business? You know, what's in it from their initiatives? Find out what, what matters to the business leader that you're pitching to, you know, um, you know, and presenting it in those terms and meeting them where they are, 
uh, versus trying to make it a technology, you know, challenge and problem that you're trying to solve, make it a business problem mm -hmm. and how it's going to help accelerate their business. That's how you, you know, gain that buy-in. Great. Thank you for that answer. I've done that um, with a couple of um, organizations that I've been working with or trying to work with. And uh, what comes up is, well, we don't have the revenue. We don't have the budget. We don't have this. How do, uh, what's, what's been your experience as to the best way to get around that or get them to understand that you either pay now this price or in the future, you're going to pay even more. Um, they don't seem to get the return on investment type concept. Uh, can you uh, expound on that, please? So I would probably look at the actual particular business and the line the industry that they're in and find uh, another example of a company that had a, uh, an attack that's no longer in business because of the attack and because of their unpreparation. You know, that may help emphasize the point, you know, and hitting it as close to home as possible in regards to where they are. Um, you know, you, you, you kind of have to really find that aha moment that's going to put that light bulb above their head saying, you know, we got to do this. This could happen to So me. you kind of have to maybe do some research and probably I would look at it from the standpoint of the individual leaders uh, that are making those decisions and doing some research there too and seeing what will resonate with them and maybe even talking to some of their managers or some of their peers and trying to find a pathway that's gonna make them more sympathetic to your uh, presentation. Great. Thank you for that. I've been successful with that um, in the military and in the federal government space, um, having some difficulty. Uh, and I've been successful in one uh, commercial corporate area, uh, but, uh, I keep running into the into what I explained before, but I'll keep hitting at that. And uh, thank you again for answering my question. Thanks, Doc, yeah. for coming online, Billy. And uh, I'm sorry, Michael, I cut you off. Probably. I just said thank you. Yeah, great. Um, I, you know, let me just stop for a minute and just do sort of reset the conversation. Michael, we're really at time. I don't know if you've got a couple more minutes. I've got a couple more questions. So like I said, I knew this was going to blow to a lot of more questions. <laughs> But if you've got a couple more questions, I'd like to feel those questions, please. So go ahead. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, Randy, you up. And then, Michael, I'm going to come back to you after Randy Phillips speaks. I'm going to come back to you about entry level, entry level folks trying to get into cybersecurity. I want mm -hmm. to get some global sort of uh, co uh, concepts there. Uh, Randy? Hey, guys. Uh, hey, uh, Michael, I want to thank you um, for sharing. Um, uh, Everything's just been really inspirational. And um, my question um, is, is, you know, looking at your background, um, you know, you have a technical background and you made your transition to a leadership role to director and so on and so on. Um, how does someone with a very technical background that has the skills um, make that transition to a leadership role? Um, because, uh, you know, from my perspective, I, I work for a couple of companies, uh, Raytheon and CGI. And um, one of the things that's frustrating um, for me and my colleagues, you know, you know, from the bottom looking up is those leadership roles sometimes don't seem uh, obtainable or um, reachable because uh, our technical background and not necessarily business background. So um, do you recommend um, getting an MBA or, you know, what, what is your recommendations on, you know, trying to break that mold into leadership roles um, moving, moving upward? So I would say it's a couple of things, right? I, I do think that it is self-improvement. I wouldn't say that it requires, let's say an MBA or some sort of certificate course, right? And I'm gonna share my screen here, right? One more time, uh, because these are some books that I, I like. Okay, so do you see my screen now? Not yet, Michael. I don't see it yet. It's coming now, it's populating now, there you go. Okay, so do you see those? So those are four books that I really recommend, right? So 
I think part of what you what you were talking about was uh, branding, right? Of how do you position yourself in a, another view, right? So if you were a technologist, how do you position yourself as a manager, right? And to me, that is about building your brand, right? And you want to reposition that story around you to uh, talk that that when people are talking, I, I kind of relate the brand as to what are people saying about you when you're not in the room, right? Um, so when you're not in the room, you want them to talk about your managerial skills versus your technical skills, right? So the way how you do that is that you have to start now marketing yourself as a manager versus as a technician. Um, and there's a great book there called Brag, The Art of Tooting Your Own Horn Without Blowing It. Um, by Peggy Claus. Um, and it's an interesting book and it tells you about how to start building up these mini stories and how you kind of communicate those um, uh, to other people. Um, and that will then start the chain of people talking about you in a certain way, right? It also has some tactics too about interviewing. You know, people always make the mistake of when they go to an interview and the manager says, okay, I have your resume in front of you. I uh, mean, tell me a little bit about yourself. They start reading off line by line what's on their resume. You know, what they really want to hear is tell me about the story in between. Tell me why do you think that you'd be a great um, asset to the organization? You know, you need to basically build up that, uh, you know, what they kind of call brag bites in this book that's going to start telling a really great story about you and make you resonate and put you above the board. So that's one book that I would really recommend. The second one is Never Eat Alone which talks about relationship building. How do you build relationships with people, right? And the whole theme of the book is, you know, if you're working in an organization, you don't want to eat by yourself. So you don't want to take your lunch hour by yourself. You know, you should always be meeting with other people in the organization, telling your story, again, bragging about yourself. Um, so that this way, when a position comes up and they're thinking about they need a new manager, you know, you're going to be the first person that they're going to come to. Right, because your story's getting around. You know, the Empowering Yourself book too is a great book, I thought, because it's especially written for minorities and it talks about, you know, this theoretical concept. Not I'm not saying theoretical, I, I wouldn't I shouldn't say theoretical, but this concept of a glass ceiling and is it really real? And it talks about mentorships and sponsorships and how you actually get promotions in organizations. Right. So it's not and it's based upon this formula called pie. Right. A lot of people think that they're going to get a promotion based on their performance. But really, it's mm -hmm. based upon your image and your exposure or your network within the organization, because typically the way how promotions are done is four or five leaders are sitting in a room and they'll say, is David qualified for this position? And if all of the four of them say, yes, you got the promotion. If two people say, who's David? You know, <laughs> you just got sunk. Right. You know, so it's about, again, networking, telling that story, getting that brand out to different people, especially those sponsors in the organization that are making this decision. Um, and that's how you go from a technical role to a managerial role. And then that's how you start to climb the ladder. So, you know, the these are some really great books, that I think, to kind of really kind of help get you there. Awesome. Okay. Thank you so much. Good, thank you. Michael, I wanted to just get back to you about this entry, uh, this uh, entry, entered apprentice or entry level journey to cybersecurity. Not everybody starts at the same place. Some of the folks that um, I've been dealing with lately, as I mentioned earlier, are people in Brownsville, Brooklyn that still live in the projects, if you will, and you're giving them a sense of the understanding what cybersecurity is, what the language is like, how to communicate, how to do this, how to, how to have a conversation, how to position yourself, how to begin to create your own brand. How do you begin to you know, learn, learn cybersecurity? Is this as much for, an entry, for a person in entry level, is it as much about certifications as it is about training, as it is about opportunities? I mean, what's, what comes first? What, what's the chicken or the egg in this conversation? We should well, I, I think certifications help get you into the door, you know, but once you're in the door, you have to kind of keep yourself inside, right? So that's one thing. I, I think that, you know, basically being able to brand yourself and talk about what your capabilities are and having an organization take a chance on you is also important. Um, I think 
getting mentors and then sponsors that can help you uh, break the doors and get into an organization is also critical. But I would also say too, the sponsorship comes into entry level programs, right? There are organizations out there that kind of help break down those barriers. Like one of the ones that I'm, I'm really passionate about is a program called Year Up, right? And you know, we talked about you know our communities, right? You know, and the fact that they haven't changed. And let's face it, they're not going to change for a while. Um, but are there programs out there that can help take people that are underrepresented, underserviced, um, and give them an opportunity, right? And that's where I think programs like Europe kind of come in, um, where you know they have like a six month program where they'll teach you some cybersecurity skills, but it's a little bit beyond cybersecurity. It's technology, it's accounting, it's marketing, right? But then the other portion too about that is how do you have the etiquette to work within a corporation, right? You know, and that comes down to you know, dress and talk and do presentations, not show up late, you know, all of those factors as far as how do you give them the soft skills, soft skills. to be attractable and work inside of a major organization. And what we're finding now is that companies are starting to really open up to that fact of how do they do more diverse hiring? You know, a lot of the companies today are really focusing in on diverse hiring practices, right? And they're looking for sources that can help them with um, bringing in those kind of diverse hires, right? Um, and unfortunately, people need a little bit more education and training so that they can survive and succeed in a corporation because you just can't walk in off the street, get sure. the job, and then basically also maintain the job, right? So there's some coaching and some guidance that kind of needs to happen there too. Sure, sure. So look, we're I know we're past time here. I just wanted to go through the room one more time and see if there's anybody else that had a question. Uh, but uh, Michael, stop sharing for a minute so I can share, please. I just wanted to uh, sure. share some things going going down the line here. Um, where are we here? Uh, there you are, Michael. I'm gonna share this and um, go here so that everybody can see this. So today we've had a good op opportunity to speak with Michael Palmer, to listen to Michael Palmer, talk to us about his his process, his approach in his career. Um, I'm gonna close the room soon, but I also wanted everyone here to take a clip of this um, survey link. And, and Michael, you too, if you don't mind, go to that link and just give your perspective to Cyversity on how this conversation went. We're not in jeopardy of getting canceled. I'm just saying they wanna be able to know how we're doing on conveying the message of, uh, of cybersecurity engaged approach and then how we're doing on inter, uh, interviewing folks like Michael to, to bring their uh, perspective to the, to the industry. Michael, if you had a question for us, if you had a question for all of us here, what would that question be uh, that we could take away from this conversation and, and, and think about that question and utilize it? So the first thing I would ask a question for you, David, is can you put that link into the chat so this way we can click on it because I can't click on that link. <laughs> uh, the other question that I would probably ask is, you know, what can organizations like mine be able to do to kind of help you guys succeed? You know, um, you know, how can I be an advocate to bring forth something that we can do at scale to help others? Right. I know that I'm going to follow up with you uh, and, and I know I'm going to follow up with you because there's something that, that we're doing that I'm doing that I, that I wanted to get your perspective on and your opinion on. Um, and you've, you've sort of answered a couple of questions today, but I know I'm going to follow up with you. If you would, look, you guys can go to LinkedIn and, and, and find Michael if you want to connect with him directly. Uh, but um, I want to say thank you very much for the, for the opportunity, Michael, to really speak to you. I learned a little bit more about you today than when I first met you in Atlanta, work, walking on the walk mill, <laughs> on the treadmill there. And, mm -hmm. um, uh, and I learned a little, lot, lot more about you today and on Clubhouse. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate you giving us the opportunity to speak to these folks and really give some guidance. This is what our Cyversity Alumni Impact, excuse me, Cyversity Impact is really about. And I think that um, 
your story is so relevant. Mm -hmm. I really think your story is relevant. I really appreciate it very much. Hey, David, just one more thing. I just wanted to kind of clarify that, that, that question that I posed back, right? And just to kind of give you a little understanding of what I meant there, right? Is that many companies, including my own, have started up corporate social responsibility programs, right? right? Which is how do we engage? How do we give back more to the community? So that's what I kind of really want to make sure that, you know, that we know. So if there's something that, you know, we can really think of, especially if it's going to be something that can scale, right? And, you know, is there a program that we can scale that's going to basically hit, you know, all of the states, all of the areas that we operate into, the countries that we operate into, you know, we kind of look for those kind of mass ideas. So, you know, open to anything that, you know, could help us with, you know, how do we scale and provide better services for the community? Yeah, I think I've got to, I think, I, let's not talk about it here. <laughs> I'm going to give you a call, <laughs> Michael, and can talk. I think you'll love what we're talking about. Listen, uh, I, 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 I've queued up the closing the closing music. <laughs> and so I really appreciate everybody coming today. And Michael, more than ever, uh, I'm glad I had an opportunity to get to know you a little bit better. And it's been a pleasure. I hope you enjoyed this conversation. I did. You, know, you gained something out of it as well. Hey, until next month, listen, everybody, if you can see on screen, March, we have Brandon Perkins, who happens to be on the call today in silent mode. Brandon Perkins, who's the uh, practice manager from uh, from uh, Amazon Web Services. Um, that's in March and April. It's the new CISO for Equifax Canada, Octavia. In um, in uh, May, it's Lisa Beth Latini Walker. She's the CEO from Lumen Enterprise Worldwide Endeavors. Then in uh, June, it's the CI Deputy CIO and CISO from Department of uh, Department of uh, Commerce, Ryan Hicks. And then we'll be following up with a new person to the industry, Kiana Hicks. She's got a long history in security. She worked with some very big companies. She's starting her own company and she's an entrepreneur and she looks a lot like us and she's going about her business there. So I really want to thank you all. Come back next month. Every month, the fourth Saturday of every month is when we get together. Michael, please join us again at any time. Come and drill us and give us more, give us more wisdom. Really appreciate it. Until then, everybody, uh, what do we say in Brooklyn? Yo, I'm out. <laughs> That's what we say in Brooklyn. All right, guys, thanks very much, and you guys be well. Mm -hmm.